ಗ್ರೀಟಿಂಗ್ ಸರ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಕನ್ನಡ ಫಿಲ್ಮಿ ಕ್ಲಬ್ ಪಾಡ್ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಉಳಿದವರು ಕಂಡಂತೆ ಕಂಪ್ಲೀಟೆಡ್ ಟೆನ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ಎಸ್ಟಡೆ ಅಂಡ್ ದಟ್ ಮಾರ್ಕ್ಸ್ ಟೆನ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಯುವರ್ ಫಾರ್ಮಲ್ ಡೆಬ್ಯೂ ಟು ಕನ್ನಡ ಸಿನಿಮಾ ಕಂಗ್ರಾಚುಲೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ದಟ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ವಿತ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸೊ ಯು ಸ್ಟಡೀಡ್ ಎಟ್ ಎಲ್ ವಿ ಪ್ರಸಾದ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಯು ವರ್ಕ್ ಫಾರ್ ಅ ಗುಡ್ ವೈ ಲೈಕ್ ಬಾಂಬೆ ಅಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ಯು ವೆಂಚರ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಕನ್ನಡ ಸಿನಿಮಾ ವಿತ್ ಉಳಿದವರು ಕಂಡಂತೆ how was the transition like what were you doing in bombay and how did you find olidavaru kandante so you know it's funny but for me it was never a thing to work in bombay or hindi or anything i remember my professor in college also during the interview arun was asking me what's your plan later and i told him i said nothing i don't have a plan i'm going to finish and then i'm going to look for work so he said yeah but uh, have you thought about looking in bombay i said no there's nothing like that work is work wherever i get work i want to work in fact i remember there's a lot of cinematographers down south malayalam cinematographers we know who was really fond of you know had contacted him so it was all over the place what happened was for some reason uh just happened that bobby sir was there anshuman male i knew people who knew them just they put me in touch they said come to bombay so i literally shifted to bombay with a suitcase and started a string there so i was there for a good 3 uh, years though you know it's funny i was still staying out of a suitcase okay. i had not even bought a cupboard there i remember my younger sister was there she had come she shifted out her cupboard was there it was given to me it was literally like that i never shifted out hmm. and uh, it was actually a facebook ad for this movie called be mechanical other shishurappa was directing it which was there on uh, facebook and you know he said looking for a cinematographer and i said okay so i came to bombay i remember catching a bus meeting there meeting him everything seemed good and then i remember going back in the bus and thinking whether i'm actually going to do this or no it was quite a funny thing because uh, there was a lot of assisting work still happening where Kamal Negi sir and Mitesh Mechandani, they were all shooting films, they were all, you know, Mitesh, I used to work with the chief, with him also, and Bobby sir also used to keep on calling me for second camera, so it was all happening, and I remember going back home in Bombay, and you know, just, and then I had this suddenly calling me up and saying, what do we do about this, what do we do about that, and how do we do uh, about this set, and it, before I knew it, I was just uh, in it, hmm. so it was never a decision I think I had to really make, I was still very confused about things because for me, I've never thought, I mean, this is my personal thing when I went to Chennai also, yeah. or wherever I go, I don't think ever language or any of this is a barrier as such. I feel like, you know, the exciting part is, is exploring something new. So for me, it was just like, okay, let's go ahead with this. And that's how, that was it. Yeah. That's how it started over here. And then, as I told you, uh, Rakshit saw B mechanical and he... liked it and there were some common contacts and he got in touch with me and before I knew it again I was this time this time the difference was on a flight <laughs> but yeah I mean, again I was heading back to Bangalore and then just that's where it went yeah uh, you were uh, you were saying language was never a barrier and mm-hmm. I think that really suits the medium you are working with yeah. you're working with visuals yeah so language does uh, you know stop being a barrier when it comes to visuals yeah 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 it does in the sense uh, for me what was important the only thing I always ask everyone for is I need an English translation mm-hmm. so that's the one thing I want I want to understand what the scene is about yeah. I want to understand what the actors are seeing yeah. once I've got that now it's okay I've understood that the, you know, they're both are fighting. Now, I don't want to get too much into the, you know, in-depth of what is happening. All that I want to understand the scene is about them fighting. Then we'll go ahead. Mm. Next, it's all universal. No, she hits him. She walks. Yeah. There's nothing that's going to change with that. So, then we go on and on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you start collaborating with Rakshit sir for Olida Oru Kandante. Yeah. And again, that marks your first formal debut. Yeah. And uh, with the visuals of Olida Oru Kandante, I think Olida Oru Kandante gets everything right, <laughs> including the visuals, which is brilliant. Thank you. So, uh, five chapters in Olida Oru Kandante. Yeah. Uh, did you approach each chapter differently in terms of visuals? And how did you do that? So, you know, it's very funny. The first meeting I had with Rakshit and we both, you know, that time DI was becoming very big. Like this whole thing about looks, about creating different tones was getting very big. And it was around that time, Khaki and all this. DI was a very new thing. Sanjay Gupta used to come out with all this Zinda and all these films with Sanjay. That, that whole phase was there. So, you know, the blue tone, green tone. 
and i remember meeting him the first meeting itself okay i told him when he explained the whole thing to me i told him just one thing i said let's not do that and he also was totally on page he's like i don't want the film looking to loud too many colors too many different things happening and making it look like a gimmick okay because we both understood that the script the story itself is very good so that's the one thing i'm so sorry that's the one thing we didn't want to get into at all so what happened eventually was what i wanted from rakshita i remember we met the first time and then we both actually went for a movie called mumbai calling or something mm-hmm. and then we were both just talking and uh, the good thing about the relationship with him was what he explained to me was the characters mm-hmm. where he gave me inputs which i don't think uh, were something which a dop would ask okay it was very generic in a way where he told me you know achutana's character is spirit uh, you know kishore is a ghost really? and you know tara ma'am is earth rakshit richi is fire rishab yeah. is water yeah. so when he explained all these things to me i understood each element what it was and that's how we treated the film mm. so with rakshit you know his introduction and all we got all the dutch angles happening okay with rishab when we introduce him we have the water in the background with achutana it's always like a crow is lurking and trying yeah. to look at him so we did a lot of handle for that okay with kishore we treated a lot of neutral colors so we played with those things where we didn't go too loud where we didn't think of you know okay overtly dramatize it because it's five chapters yes. but we said we'll give those little little nuances where we uh, make the difference come out yet not in your face okay you i want you to concentrate on this yeah so that's how we kind of treated the whole five chapters with the lensing there were a lot of things we did yeah. there were i mean we used a lot of nets for some of the flashback sequences to make it look like that diffused look uh nets so, in nets uh, so in behind the lenses i i still do love all these things so behind the lenses i'll cut a piece of those you know uh, that what these uh, uh, women wear the jura nets and put them okay. and i started i even started doing different colors for different tones so we started doing a lot of these small small things yet we decided as a rule not to make it too loud in di so yeah, yeah that was yeah all right um while uh, shooting ulida or kandante uh, did you face any challenges because you this was your first formal debut with a budget like that were yeah. there any challenges logistical creative a lot of challenges i think uh, to be honest even though it was my first i'll say this very honestly even today if i'm shooting a film every day is a challenge i realize because every day just my way of working is i always have three plans in place you know i'll always have a plan a plan b plan c plan a is when i know okay i'll try doing something fun try experimenting but i know my, many a times you don't get the time so you shift to plan b and then you go to plan c which is like the backup plan yeah. so with the you can you know to be very honest since it was the first film yes it was a challenging yeah because it was a scale it was a huge scale I and mean, when i look at back i still remember my assistant that time ranjit who is still my chief him telling me sir up uh, you know you might uh, be very nervous but it doesn't look like it looks like you're confident about whatever you're shooting i said no i'm pretending to be confident because if i start showing that you know i'm shit scared about the stuff we're doing and i'm confused and everyone's going to be on the same page so yeah i mean uh, every day was a challenge yeah. the weather was such a challenge i still remember when we went for the recce it was hot summer and everything was brown and I had these ideas where we'll be using a lot of tobacco filters you know sometimes to get that brown look and get udupis that brown but when we eventually went to show it was raining and everything had shifted to green so in, in immediately that was a challenge in itself you know where i realized that what uh, the perception i had it's not going to because you know when you're in film school you have all these things about how you design everything how you have a plan in mind and all that but then i realized reality doesn't work like that and then of course you know i mean every day was a challenge in the sense you know when you're coming from a film school background or whatever background you always feel okay you're going to have the scene like this and all then eventually when you go on the set you realize everything's working against you you know the lights never going to work with you the weather's not going to work with you the locations are not going to work with you so then you keep on trouble shooting on the spot if this is not working what is it that i can do to make it look like that mm-hmm. and Yeah. with everything yeah. and ulida uh, or kandante happens mm. and eventually kirik party also happens mm-hmm. and then one more major work comes out that is avaneshri man narayana uh-huh. yeah so uh, from ulida or kandante or kirik party avaneshri man narayana again is a big transition yeah. in terms of budget or in terms yeah, of story yeah. and also very particularly how you uh, i what i noticed is how you approach the lighting in avaneshri yeah, man narayana yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, when 
a budget like Avane Shriman Narayana opens up for you, mm -hmm. what kind of resources did it bring for you? Mm -hmm. And how did you make use of them to achieve those visuals? So, uh, you know, it's a, uh, the thing is, it all depends on the scale. Now, I've realized like a big scale movie needs to look like a big scale movie. So, you know, you need the resources for that. If you were talking about saying lighting up a 200 by 200 set, you need lights for that. Yeah. So, then uh, eventually we had the luxury of lights, which in UK, I still remember I was the first guy to ask for five 4K pass. Mm -hmm. And it was a big thing that he's ordering a five 4K pass. But was I, that a film school influence? No, no. It was just that, uh, I, to be honest, we needed it. Yeah. We needed it because, I mean, uh, things were, di I, I don't know yeah, whether, you know, how I look into it, but there was a certain way I wanted to light the film. In UK also, I wanted to have soft light for my actors. I didn't want to just put them in any light. I didn't want to have a harsh light with just one 4K straight and casting a shadow on his face. I was very particular. It's like, see, if you've called me for the job, I want you guys to look Good, I want you guys to look the character that you're looking. If you need to have a soft light on your face, you need to have a soft light. So that's where the lights came in and I needed those lights. Because also we were shooting in Udupi, we were shooting in conditions which we didn't know. There was harsh sunlight sometimes, there was overcast sometimes. So when Shreeman I don't know what happened was the scale was huge. It was a huge scale. Yeah, you needed like a lot of light. So the resources, of course, the budget helped in terms of I could give as many streaks as I wanted to. And I could monitor my light. You know, I don't need to just have one light with one frame. I can have four lights with a softer quality of light, which eventually makes a big difference. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, in terms of equipment, if I could ask, yeah. uh, how did things change for you in Kirik Party or with Avanesh Sriman Nara? See, Kirik Party, it was very clear. It was a very low-budget film. We all knew where we were getting into. The first time Rakshit met me, the example was a film called Premam, where he said, you know, this is how the film has to be it has to be a very low budget it can't be so then when I a lot of people you know it's funny but a lot of people have asked me Kirik Party doesn't look good this it doesn't look like Uli Dovarakan and this that I like see listen it's uh, uh, you, it can't look like that in fact I remember my assistants also asking me sometimes why don't you glamorize it more I said no you don't understand I can't not because I don't want to not because I can't ask for two three lights no one is going to say no but it doesn't need it why doesn't it need it? The film's not about them uh, getting backlights and golden lights and yellow hues and purple color. It is about the college students. It is, has to be as simple as it can be. If it takes it away, if it becomes very dramatic, the whole film mood will change. And we knew what we were getting into. We knew the film, that's why the lenses I'd used were CP2 lenses and a red uh, dragon camera. Uh, I kid you not, no one would have used those lenses here. And uh, I remember Ulidhar in fact, I had the best of setups, which people were amazed that I'm getting that setup here. People are amazed I'm shooting with a totally opposite setup, mm. which is, uh, uh, I mean, it was the CP2 lenses are, no one uses them for mm. shooting. I was like, no, let's use them. I don't think anyone had shot a film with that over here before. I like, no, why not? Those lenses are giving me the soft texture that I want. I want a soft texture to the film. I want it to look very realistic. I want it to look like... We are all living it. Yeah. So why not go for it? Yeah. So yeah, I think that's why the budget and all that made a difference. And you know, I realized that the budget is not much. You can't, uh, you have to understand also what you're doing. You can't uh, think of, uh, you know, thinking uh, things above the budget also. So, yeah. yeah, that was pretty much it. One, I find a very important takeaway from what you told right now. It is that your story mm. must dictate your budget and yeah, also yeah. the grand you're, you're trying yeah. to go with with visuals. Yeah. Because like you were saying, if Kirik Party had, uh, you know, a fantastic or very vibrant visuals, it wouldn't feel like the personal college story we experienced it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. No sir. worries. No yeah. worries. Please. Um, one last thing. Mm. Uh, again, in Avanesh Shriman Narayana, a lot of tricky shots we find uh, if you go by the, if you are looking at the title song mm -hmm. or a lot of fight scenes in Avanesh Riman yeah. Narayana too, they are very unconventional. Yeah. Um, what was in your mind while shooting the fight scenes of Avanesh Riman Narayana? How were you planning it with uh, Sachin or Rakshit and how did you go about that? So, uh, Bikram Master was the fight master. Now, I'll be very honest with you, when it comes to Rakshit and even to an extent Sachin, I don't get involved too much in the short breakdown. Okay. So with Rakshit, I've always had that relationship where he's very clear with the 
short breakdown so different directors have been very different for me some want me to get more involved some don't and my thing is i've understood that sometimes i i always expect the director to have a good vision of what he wants i want him to tell me i said buddy listen this is where i want to track i want to track into him and i want to pan so with the uh, the fight sequences also it was a collaboration of four of us deciding so rakshit would say okay this shot sachin would say yeah i want this shot vikram master would say i'll give this action and i'll be like okay listen what i'll do is i'll put a spotlight so that the action comes out the way you guys imagine it rather than you know it looking like I, how important is it is it punch if he's picking him up what lens do i want to use you know what lens do i want to use so that this gets exaggerated more so i feel sometimes it's not always about uh, which most people don't i don't know they this i think it just takes a journey where it's not about the shot alone hmm. where it's uh, everything is a combination that's when the real joy comes out of it yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, um, you were saying uh, it's not just about the shot alone mm-hmm. and that gives me a good segue for my next segment in the interview sure, sure. Uh, so we can move to the next segment yeah, yeah, please, in the please, interview please, please, please. um uh now we'll start uh, talking about your creative process and okay. the technicalities associated with it a little bit <laughs> yeah uh, so first uh, whenever we are looking at pre production in the previous interviews we've always heard the director's perspective hmm. uh, so now i want to ask you uh, say a script is completed and it reaches you hmm. so that's when your pre production starts yeah. with all the collaboration with your team members um what all do you first start doing in your pre production once you get a script and you see the scenes in it okay so the first thing is when i get the script i'll read it once i'll read it twice i'll probably read it three times i'll get a good idea of what the script is then the next thing i'll do is honestly i'll not think about anything i'll talk to the director i'll trouble him with at least a lot of times asking him listen buddy what do you have in your mind what is it that you want what is it you are envisioning here do you when i go through the script suppose it's a full on you know action film i'll ask him straight away i'll say do you think of the action as a john wick action or is your character a denzel washington equalizer whatever see because uh, honestly our, our references is the only thing that helps now we are not uh, starting something we are all building on to something that's been there for years now let's face it everyone keeps saying this this but the truth is we are in a industry which is not very old because if you look at it it's hardly it's i think what uh, night uh, 90 you're talking about like 70 yeah. 80 odd years yeah. but we are building on to things now so a good reference point could be anything from a film in the 60s italian film you know sometimes i'll look into that or i'll look into this and i'll be like okay he's talking about a murder in at a night i'm like you know let's think about passion of christ which is the 1940 john of arc movie and let's even look at those shots so for me the referencing is of course subconsciously a lot of films yeah. so one thing i did in film school i kept on watching films i i used to watch three films a day and i'm talking about everything from hungarian directors to french directors to italian to every world cinema to bengali everything that i could see so that subconsciously my mind is there now what happens is when something comes to my head i'll subconsciously think about those yeah. films too and you know think about the treatment then i have to wait for the director to give me inputs then we'll sit we'll talk then what happens is we'll start discussing with the production designer as to what color palettes mm-hmm. we are going with because i can as i told you i don't get into the short breakdown and i don't want too much <laughs> i want to understand what the director has in his mind first if he's having a huge scale what are the color palettes we are looking at then the pre production starts with all the costume designers a lot of times you know people think it's a small thing but it's a huge thing because your if you even notice avnish shiman a simple character like sanvi's when it starts off she's wearing pastel colors and she's wearing cardigans and then as the movie goes on she'll start wearing red and blue and dark colors which is after the interval when we see a change in a character there's a proper change in her costume too same with kirik party rakshit in the first half is wearing white t-shirts he's blue co- you know light blue shirts corduroys and as you move on to the second half is into darker co- tones so all that work starts where it's not just a ye lighting karunga wo lighting karunga that's actually the last bit that's actually once your locations are done once you've got an idea of what the location looks like whether you're shooting here or you're shooting there then you get into the term of okay how will i get the lighting thing but in terms of lighting also lensing also 
camera equipment also you have a certain rule whereas as i told you in kerik we decided not to use backlight we decided not to glamorize in shriman we knew very well we wanted it to look very a little you know we wanted a element of fantasy in it sorry so we went ahead with an element of fantasy in it where we used three soft filters mm -hmm. nets we got those lenses which will give it a little glow so that all pre production and uh, matter yeah <laughs> uh, right so usually when we are thinking of directors of photography cinematographers yeah. uh, we assume okay uh, they will be involved in the recce and maybe they will be involved in the color grading in the post production and a few other places but costumes were a revelation to me costumes yeah. makeup everything yeah see because a production design is such an important thing i keep telling uh, everyone this i say if you don't have your production design right you can't light up no mm. what do you show at the end of the day as a cinematographer what can you show if you don't have anything to show yeah so if everything from the hair makeup costume production design everything falls into place you have a good image out. yeah uh, so with so i find that you you were involved in the costumes too mm. uh, absolutely the recce and the color grading and all of those processes mm. uh, were there any other departments of uh, making the film where you were involved that we would no no not okay nothing as such so, I mean, direction i'd sit with them for the short breakdown scripting no and okay. uh, music no yeah. no none of that oh, okay yeah uh, so uh, this question is because you had an experience with working with both smaller budgets hmm. and very big budgets hmm. so uh, this is about smaller budgets so a lot of filmmakers when they start out they are bound to start with a small budget yeah. and that brings in a lot of restrictions hmm. so when someone is working with a small budget where should most of the uh, photography budget go uh, not as advice maybe but as a breakdown where should most of the photography budget go lighting or equipment or should you save it for post hmm you know honestly uh, it's again a mixture of things uh, you suppose we have a very small budget today and you say can i want to shoot this uh, this scene has to be these two this couple and you know the girls planning to kill him this is simple as that and you like that's the her intent has to be like she wants to murder him and he doesn't know about it okay. i'll talk to you i'll say uh, on what do we do about it because uh, and you uh, your next brief is it has to be in a big factory now the thing is and then you say it has to be night so i know i'm screwed there's no way i can light up a big factory at night with the budget that we have hmm. so first thing is i'll talk to you and i'll try and t tell you no one can we make it early morning where you know it's still night can we make some changes in the script for this because see, you have to understand there are things possible there are things that are not possible and doing i personally believe doing something shabbily is not the answer you have to work around it when you don't have a budget you have to think how you can work smarter make things look big make things look good yet not you know make them look shabbily at all so i don't know if you know this movie called 10 Yeah, which was I know uh, ten, nah, you so, directed it. Yeah, we I directed it. So that film, what we did, then we knew we don't have a budget, and it's not about having a budget. We knew we didn't want to spend too much. We didn't want to have fifty people on the set. We shot it with eighteen people, but then we had decided earlier when we went for location recce. You won't believe the amount of houses we would have seen to settle down because we knew we needed two, three things. We needed the texture right. We needed light coming in. We couldn't go for a place where we had to light up. Two reasons: one was I didn't want that film to look unrealistic yeah. or glamorized at all, and second was we didn't have the budget to get five light men there. I didn't want to get into that zone because I know where all it adds up. So as I said, you have to work smartly with equipment. Also, see, equipment is a very big. Uh, thing these days where everyone thinks equipment matters it doesn't matter i'm not going to say it doesn't matter but that's your last thing first understand now if you have to light up a factory as i told you first understand what you can do with the budget you have you can't make it look night you don't have that many lights to make it look good okay change it to a morning dawn scene secondly now you need a certain basic light so that you can add some contrast if the woman is planning to kill him you want a little shadow on her face when she turns around and looks away you will need to create it for that if there is good natural light coming in that's a blessing but if it's not what do you do you need a basic setup of light where do you need what you need is where you have to decide now these days it's a blessing you know there's so many of these uh, led lights mm. where you don't need big huge generators for it so you have to Okay, you've got the light. Now the next thing that matters is this is where 
forget the budget your mind has to work now i want her to look scary i want her to look happy i want her to look what that's where it really makes a difference i feel a lot of people these days think of light as a tool it's not a tool it's a very creative tool right. how i light up a face really makes a difference consciously and subconsciously to what people are thinking okay. so then that's where the budget doesn't matter i might have one tube light one bulb i have to decide what i want to do with it mm. so creatively it makes a lot of difference whether big budget or small budget your creative call can't change yeah so i think that's uh, the thing um i'll take a small deviation here yeah, yeah. Uh, you were talking about lighting up characters uh, because it subconsciously affects uh, how you perceive them yeah uh, could you tell us any particular examples in any of your films be it as in kirik party or even 10 mm. uh any approaches you took to lighting characters a certain way so, that yeah, yeah yeah i always have a, I, i personally love a three fourth light huh. where you know the the angle comes in from a little here okay. and there's a little contrast mm-hmm. and i am not a fan of backlights mm-hmm. and never been shriman narayana we used to give a lot of glow because i thought that made a difference but otherwise in terms of characters if you uh, if i go back to that scene where sanvi and rakshita are walking around in that uh, cave yeah so you know they're very dimly lit where you can see the fire is playing on their heads so i remember you know thinking that the fire flicker is working out well because the character arc is shifting where everything is going to move turn around so we worked on that then even kirik party as i told you we decided not to glamorize them we didn't give three fourths we didn't give half light i am not a fan of very heavy contrast of a half light hmm. uh, but when i i mean personally just i like my actors looking good at the same time working with the scene i am a fan of putting them in the dark hmm. if i could uh, unfortunately with most commercial films you can't but i would love to not really light them up much at all so yeah i think all these things are she uh, we were conducting to also in fact i remember where there's one shot this actually an assistant of mine had done this so tara madam is sitting right outside waiting for rishab and there was a direct light at her i had never lit up like that okay. and i saw it and i loved it okay. i told him i said this is beautiful because she is looking hard she is going into that place where you know you have no idea what is happening so it was looking good so i think all these small small things yeah yeah okay and uh, i'm so sorry even balaji as a villain huh. if you look in shriman narayana he is always lit up only this much okay he is hardly lit up i loved lighting him up like it was so much fun you could have with him yeah, so, yeah. okay yeah. um so my next question is again uh, going back to pre production okay. uh, so uh, some things are choices in pre productions so you mm-hmm. can do with it or you can do without it and one of those i believe is storyboarding mm-hmm. so with all your previous projects have you done storyboards Hmm. and uh, were they of any logistical use or creative use to so you so when i was doing 10 i made a storyboard i used to make it every day before going on the set the reason why i used to do it is for me visually it works well where i look at it as a comic book strip it helps me okay these two are meeting what i want next what i want next what i want most people don't like it which is also i think perfectly okay storyboard i feel yeah it can help you a lot it can but also if you have the time and if you have planning because uh, you know unfortunately what of a lot of thing that happen is you reach the location and you realize what you're doing because uh, sets is a different thing where you have everything to the t when it's real locations a lot of things won't work in your favor so storyboarding doesn't help that thing so storyboarding is again a very 50 50 thing for i think ads and all a lot of them work because it's just a day shoot but for scenes uh, i think a lot of people also see the moment and get things out mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, asn didn't have a storyboard no no no, no. Oh, okay Mm-hmm. yeah uh, we'll move to color grading now. sure uh, so again when a conventional idea of a dop mm-hmm. is that uh, they shoot on set and mm-hmm. there is very minimal involvement maybe in the color grading process but that mm-hmm. might not be true so mm-hmm. how are you involved in the color grading and what kind of decisions do you get to make in the color grading process <laughs> with the di artists Hey, uh, again it's a very subjective thing because everyone has a different way of working that uh, just my personal way see i started from a film background over there we used to just have rgb yeah. and you know brightness and uh, things so i've till date i think i i work like that yeah. i don't rely too much on what is going to happen later i what i see is what i want in the final image yeah. i don't want uh, you know i mean i don't 
feel like I'm shooting this and I want something different later. If I'm going over exposure or if I'm doing an underexposed scene, there's a reason why I'm doing it. So I'll stick to it. Hmm. Now when it comes to color grading, now what's happened with digital is things have changed a little. Now we have a lookup table. So I what I've started doing is I start making my lookup tables where you know they're installed in the camera. So now if I'm going for a certain look for a scene, I can see what is coming up. So when I know what is coming out, my contrast levels, my brightness level, my colors, how red is reacting to it, I can see it in the thing, it's okay. Because then the grader, what he needs to do, the colorist is, he needs to just match it. Then eventually, of course, I mean, I go and sit with him, we match the values. But as per now, the involvement is not too much for me. Mm-hmm. I prefer setting up the looks, shooting with it. The footage goes to the colorist. He sees what the look is. He understands what I have in my mind. He'll grade it. Mm-hmm. Simple as that. I keep it a little more streamlined now. Okay. Uh, again, uh, one more question yeah. about budgeting itself. Yeah. And uh, about starting out. Hmm. Um, so, a lot of newcomers are entering the industry and a lot of teams are entering the industry. Hmm. Directors, DOPs hmm. and all of them. Uh, so, if you could tell us what are some mistakes that newcomers might do while beginning I mean, hmm. in terms of cinematography yeah, yeah. and uh, is, are there ways to avoid it? What are what should we be prioritizing? What are the mistakes we are making? See, I just feel like uh, whatever you're doing, no, it's okay. There's no, I mean, I'll be very honest. There's no mistakes because I, even I'm making mistakes today. I'm also still learning from them. I go, sometimes I shoot and I come back thinking, oh God, what have I done? <laughs> I'm still making mistakes. My only thing would be uh, do whatever you're doing with love. My thing was, uh, you know, there's no technicality to it. I used to tell a lot of people that if you're doing things from your heart, it's okay. If you're lighting up and you know what you're doing and you're doing it with a feel, it's okay. If you're lighting up just so that you can shoot and just so that, you know, what they say, just light up for the sake of it, then I feel it's wrong. Like I'd always say this, you know, in my life, I don't think there's any shots I've taken where I'm not convinced about what I'm shooting. So whenever you're shooting, just be sure, just be conscious of what you're shooting. That's all my advice would be. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. One more thing is, uh, this is more of a personal question to you maybe. What hmm. do you think of it? Uh, so my question is, uh, Canada cinema industry right now, uh, we are seeing a huge evolution in visuals. Mm. Uh, maybe that evolution has always been there, but it's more evident now mm. in terms of, like you were saying, uh, color grading going mm. digital mm. and a lot of lighting approaches mm. and color palettes, mm. all of those things, right? Uh, but right now, are there any uh, you know visual aesthetics or themes or cinematography techniques that we aren't exploring much of right now? No, nothing like that there. Yeah. Okay. I think honestly nothing like that. See, I'm no, uh, the reason I'm the wrong person to ask that is I don't believe in uh, too much technicalities or anything. I don't believe in equipment gives you something. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in that. I believe your eyes, your mind, your heart is giving you what you want. Okay. So I think, no, the brilliantly everyone is shooting. It's uh, the same power with not even India, I'd say everywhere. Mm-hmm. A techno crane or a new technology or a balloon light and all these things don't make a difference. Mm. They really don't. If your mind is there and you know what you want, it's the same thing. Okay. So it's more so uh, what you're doing it and uh, what the theme or the intent is. What the vision than, is. Yeah, what the vision, the vision is rather than what the equipments are yes, or yes. how much of technicality is involved yes, in it. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, if I could go back to Uri Dauru Kandante, uh, one small deviation. If I could go back to Uri Dauru Kandante, uh, one more Beautiful feature of Ulida Kandante was its frames. Uh, maybe uh, Kishore sir's frames when he's uh, meeting his love or uh, Rishab sir's frames. And just in general, the visual aesthetics of Ulida Kandante in terms of framing was hmm. brilliant. Thank you. So, with Ulida Kandante, uh, what was your work with Rakshit sir like for composing those frames? I, it might be a vague question, but what no, was your experience like? See, with, uh, uh, with Rakshit, the relationship has always been so nice. You know, it is, it's unbelievable, but he's very clear about the shot he wants, about everything. Then after that, he just leaves me. You know, he's never interfered with the lensing, the lighting or the framing. And I still remember the biggest compliment I think I would have ever got from Rakshit was when he told me, you know, after the whole film that he's like, you know, whatever I imagine, you make it look much better. So I think that's the best compliment I could get. So with him, it's always been like that. There's no... He, 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 I mean, he, his inputs will be like, Rishabh is coming back. I And he's, uh, you know, what I want is, I want the lights to come on and come off. Then after that, he'll leave me to it. So then where to put the bulbs, what lensing to get, 
where to get that's all left up to me yeah. so i think that's how our relationship yeah. used to be over there okay uh, now i'll come back <laughs> yeah. and there is one last question yeah. and with many questions i'm asking what i'm trying to uh, do is maybe a little bit of advice or rules of thumb for uh, people who are just starting please, out please 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 uh, so with cinematography right uh, you went to film school for cinematography you went to lv prasad yeah uh, so my thing is uh some people say okay film schools do work for you and film schools don't is what some people yeah. say and it does come down to subjectivity hmm. but if i could ask in this way what did film school teach you about films and what did it not fair enough very good question so you know i'll tell you something very frankly i when i was in delhi in college i got into theater then i used to direct plays and act in plays and all that so i got into the theater background from there i wanted to make a short film i actually i had no idea about camera or anything i just got into making short films i made about two three of them started doing all that then i realized i went to the film school why i went to the film school was uh i felt like i needed a base somewhere so when i went to film school to study cinematography how it helped me was i was surrounded by people who were just doing films there was nothing else that was happening they were all you know talking about films we would talk about films we would study films and we would look at films differently earlier i think maybe you could just look at a film as a film and get entertained now suddenly it was about looking at the aesthetics of the films you know where you have professors coming in and telling you why someone would have taken a particular shot the way they would have taken so your mind starts developing a little more in terms of the aesthetics of film so for me yes i think film school was a very good thing because uh, again for me films has never just been uh, you know about going and shooting or about watching a film i love cinema i love the aesthetics behind it i love to think about why someone has done this i was recently uh, i think uh, i don't know which of the last film i'd seen recently it's a uh, 12th film Yeah I was so happy seeing that film I was like okay this is after a long time I'm seeing a director speak I'm seeing you know I'm understanding what Vidhu Vinod Chopra is trying to say how he is trying to say it why is he done so so I think that's when your mind opens up in filmmaking with a film school okay uh one more question on yeah, the yeah, same line since you brought up 12th fail right uh so with films uh, say bigger budget films mm-hmm. where uh, visuals are very evident mm-hmm. say for example Vikrant Rona or KGF or kantara mm-hmm. uh there are obvious things that make the visuals very grand and beautiful mm-hmm. like the lights or the colors in the frame and maybe even the clarity that the camera gives to mm-hmm. some extent mm-hmm. uh but apart from all of those elements and i'm sorry if my question again sounds repetitive no, no, no. apart from all of those elements what are things you must be focusing on in your frame itself <laughs> um uh, as i told you you know light is important it's yeah. very important your our work is around light yeah uh you know that scene where say uh, okay take any scene and mm-hmm. just two people sitting and talking say uh, uh two women sitting and talking about how they plan to murder their husband or whatever it is and you just throw a light on their face and you make it look flat like mm-hmm. it look like a serial mm-hmm. then suddenly you decide okay no i need to make it moody you go to the back light it look like a silhouette this will look beautiful like we might you might give it some smoke it has some ray when you suddenly decide i want one character to look more important than the other so what i'll do is i'll give them one of them a cross light so i can only see one female the other one who's committing the murder is probably in the dark so i'm saying just you know just taking this as an example this is the kind of creative calls you have to take not the creative calls ki bhai i want to use the best of camera and the best of lenses and the best of equipment and the most of light that is secondary how can i make my scene talk with light itself with the production design itself how can i make my scene talk rather than think about the equipments and yeah. the budgets okay uh what did film school not teach you oh about the industry how yeah. to deal with everything i still remember it was a harrowing experience but i still remember i think the first job i was on was with cinematographer anay goswami who was shooting no one kill jessica and i still remember the first or maybe the second day so there was a very experienced gaffer called john who was doing work and i was i was standing down and i you know you come out of film school you think you know everything and i'm telling him this life this life and at 5 in the morning he actually told me when we were going by he said you know i wanted to slap you that time i said what he said you don't realize how senior i am and you don't know shit and that's the day i realized i said uh, film school can teach you about your aesthetics it can mold you but the industry is something else the industry is not about uh, 
only cinematography. It is about dealing with people. It is about being a leader. It is about commanding 150 people on set. It is about making sure that everyone understands. And uh, touch wood, I was very lucky that way to have a boss like Bobby Singh, who for me was one of the greatest human beings I've met. So I got to learn a lot from him about being a human being. Not that much, I'd say, about work and all that, because luckily, you know, he has his vision, I have my own. But being a human being, he really taught me how to be a human being in the industry. So that, I think, is something that film school won't teach you. You'll have to learn the path you want to take. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, now I'll talk about your uh, directorial debut, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. 10. Uh, first, this, mm. uh, 10 had some hassles with promotions from mm. what we heard. Mm. Uh, could you tell us what happened with the promotions of 10? Nothing, yeah. COVID hit. I think Pushkar lost a lot of money in ASN. So, COVID hit. Everything was all over the place. And it was a very serious film. Yeah. It was yeah. very difficult. I mean, it's still difficult to get people to watch cinema now, especially something that's not at a very large scale and at a very, you know, comedy genre make people happy people don't want to go to theaters anywhere I, it's okay i mean honestly i don't go for anything that's not pulling me i, I must have gone for dune to the last film mm -hmm. uh, you know that's the kind of now i'm also very clear i'm like it's not about it's not if there is a separate market ott market and a yeah. cinema market so this was in the transition period that 10 was getting released and so it was all over the place so we didn't really have the budget to promote it so we said okay let's just do what we can so you didn't find a budget and that made it difficult? Uh, more than budget, I think the film... Uh, I mean, I don't know if he could have pushed the film. Uh -huh. But I think it was, as I told you, COVID just got over. Everyone and it, the film had been there for three years, yeah. lying. So I think everyone had kind of given up on it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's pretty much what happened. Okay, and how, uh, any feelings about that? Not really. Yeah, uh, with me, unfortunately, when I finish a project, I'm done with it. Mm -hmm. So there's no attachment, emotional, or anything to any of the projects I worked on, direction or cinematography. Yeah. So it's like done. You move on. Talking about ten, mm -hmm. uh, what was surprising to me was uh, here's a director of photography who's debuting as a director. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at the visual tone of that film, it's a very muted and almost largely dark visual tone. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I don't know if it's stereotypical, but I'd expect a colorful uh, mm -hmm. approach to your directional mm -hmm. debut. Mm -hmm. But what was the decision with uh, grading 10 that way? So again, with 10 also, we had a lot in place. Uh, you know, I knew the look of the film we were doing. Mm -hmm. I am personally not a fan of too much color neither too much brightness i like keeping things a little mellow little you know towards the dark side so with 10 i knew we could do that also now when i think about it no the story isn't a happy story i mean it's about victory it's about but it's not dealing with uh say him chilling with his friends or having a beer with his friends or joking around there's no scene which is a comic scene yeah. it's a very realistic thing and when i look at i mean just my personal perspective again when i look at life it is at a mundane level you know it is that film goes in a indie kind of a treatment where i want people to just feel the film i don't want them to get distracted by colors or by anything that's too loud so yeah. i think that's pretty much the reason why we went for it okay and why delve into direction hmm. from uh, cinematography and how was the transition like for you so you know i started off as a director and an editor okay. so i'm talking about years back say i don't know how long back now when i look at it but i used to actually edit on ulet video studio i self-learned editing i started editing music videos then I got into directing plays, then I directed short films and honestly I always thought I wanted to get into direction. The reason why I got into cinematography is I didn't want to assist in direction too long and also I realized for me visuals were speaking more. When I even direct a film, it was important to me what the visual is looking like rather than what the actor is doing. So it was a combination of things. How 10 happened was honestly, as I told you, I was always into direction. So I thought this was the right time to just give it a try mm -hmm. and I love directing but at the same time uh, for me it was more like you know I want to make the indie film that I want to make I don't want to get pressurized into making my first film or anything and I think everything just worked around that yeah. way um, 
about 10 and mm. about Vinay Rajkumar sir. Mm-hmm. So Vinay Rajkumar sir, uh, he is known for uh, choosing scripts that are non-conventional mm. or indie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he fit the role of 10 very well even before we saw him playing it. Mm-hmm. So how was your collaboration with Vinay sir yeah, like? Vinay is a gem to work with. Yeah. Like, he is a gem to work with. Like I have... Uh, I mean, he would listen and he understood what we were doing. He understood very well what we were doing. Mm-hmm. Even in terms of his weight and everything, the amount he worked on himself. I remember shooting the climax. We shot for six days continuously and he was fighting throughout. He must have lost like good five kgs by the start and the end of the fight. And he was on a strict diet. There was Everything was restricted. So, I mean, he's a gem to work with. Yeah. I really loved working with him. More... As an actor and as a person, yeah. he's very giving. He'll understand what you're trying to do. Yeah. So I think it was a beautiful experience. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Um, one more thing I notice in 10 is how the fight scenes are shot, how the boxing scenes are shot. Hmm. Uh, because uh, one thing that I noticed was not a lot of cuts, yeah. a lot of longer takes. Yeah. You seem to be fond of longer takes. See, I realize the boxers are putting in so much effort. They're actually fighting. There's no mimicking happening there's nothing like a thing and I said why not longer takes for me gives a certain conviction when the actors can pull it off I actually don't want to cut why cut it when you know and I love long takes I think if you can play around a long take and mise in it I think it's beautiful Mm -hmm. how you can get emotions ranging from you know, a person just walking to panning to coming back to his back to coming to someone else to coming back. It's beautiful if you can enjoy it. A lot of work, but yeah. Uh, but with the fights, right? Hmm. Uh, how did you... Boxing, yeah. But with the fights, how did you approach the uh, fight scenes for 10 in terms of uh, cinematography or short division maybe? So, yeah. Uh, I mean, different scenes, different fights again. But yeah, we knew... Uh, we all know, we understand what is the start middle, end, final punch, all that. So, I mean, uh, for Vinay and Bharat, they were training for good 20 days. We had the whole fight in place. There was nothing on spot. So, I saw it, we recorded it, we broke it down and then we went ahead with it. Because uh, the thing with uh, working with non-stuntmen, it's like there's always a risk of injury. You know, because, I mean, whatever said, it's hard. Going at it at each other and connecting but not hitting hard and conviction so we had to be smart about it too where we got a lot of camera movement we got a lot of handle movement we got a lot of dirty shots we had three cameras rolling at some time so that you know mix and match it that we get a cut yeah so one more thing in 10 you are both the director of photography and the director Mm -hmm. so how was it juggling between those two things was it an easy thing to do or was it a logistical challenge maybe yeah no uh, touch wood I was very blessed to you know all my assistants have been with me for years so Sanjay actually operated the camera and never held the camera I was very clear I don't want to I used to tell them listen this is the kind of light I want this is the kind of mood I want I want two sky panels here and Manu, Sanjay and Puneet would just go ahead with it they just design the whole thing you know how I want the mood and I'd go direct the actors and so it was actually a very easy process for me I mean I think now with years of experience if you have an idea of what you want as I told you first thing is the feel the problem happens when you when you're going blank then you will get all worked up. If you have an idea of, okay, this is how I want the scene to look, you explained it to everyone, as I say, channelizing your energies, then you can go ahead and do anything you yeah. want. So, uh, in that sense, uh, the photography team becomes extremely it important. It becomes your, photographer, every team becomes important. Yeah. I've always stressed on it that, uh, you know, the people I have working with me, there's a, the gaffer's been with me for 13 years now. So, I mean, you have to have a team. It's not an individual work. I can never ever, you know, take credit for doing things myself. It is a teamwork. Yeah. Because if you don't have people who can take your stress away, yeah. you know, you'll never go to the restroom then. I yeah. can't go, I keep telling these guys, I can't go for a piss if you don't feel like working. Mm-hmm. It's only when you guys and everyone is collaborating and working that I can go to the washroom and, you know, take a piss and come back. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, this is coming from a uninformed side because mm-hmm. I don't know much about it. But within a photography team within a DOP's team hmm. uh, usually say on a small budget film how many people would you have ideally and how does the division of work happen there so I think I mean it depends again on the budget but yeah I mean there 
places where I've shot with just two people with me. Where, you know, there's one person who's always going to be my right hand and there's another person who's picking up things. Mm -hmm. So I'll always need one person who has a very good idea about everything. Who's been with me who understands. More than every uh, lighting, he understands what I want. He'll understand that I don't do certain things and there are certain things I'll do. So like my gaffer will know. I don't like a light flat on the face or I don't, it doesn't work for me. He won't do it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there's one person whose inputs I'd want more. Where, you know, I'll be like, okay, listen, buddy, we are putting the camera here. What more can you do? Right. Where it'd be a younger person who's inputs because, see, for me, it's important that everyone who's worked with me goes out. Goes out and they do work themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't want someone, except my gaffer and another uh, assistant, I haven't had anyone for too long. I keep them for two, three years, train them and send them off. Mm -hmm. Because it's no use for someone who wants to become a cinematographer sticking for more than two, three years. So mm -hmm. I say, when you come in with me, my thing is you give me input. If I'm giving you opportunity i want you to work for me not in terms of just doing what i tell you i want you to give me an input i want you to light up i want you to see what can be better i want you to try things and if you can't do that then it doesn't make sense you being here or me taking you hmm. so yeah okay <laughs> yeah. a lot of things i noticed about 10 i'm talking about here and uh, one more thing i, I notice in 10 is a good mix of static shots and movement shots. A lot of movement shots and also whenever it's there, a lot of static shots too. Hmm. So with your approach to both direction and cinematography, uh, when do you uh, decide, okay, this is where I'll use a static shot. I won't move the camera at all. And this is where I will move the camera because in recent times at least, I see a lot of obsession with camera movements itself. So, where does static find its place there and where do you move the camera? Um, uh, I don't, I mean, like, if I look back at it now, I'll think about it. But uh, to me, I think it just has to make sense if I'm doing something. Whether I'm keeping static, whether I'm moving it, it has to make sense to me. Yeah. I need to know why I'm doing something. I can't just go ahead and say, okay, a touch and click, I'll let it. You know, let's just do it because it looks cool. Sometimes, yeah, it looks cool also works in commercial film. If it looks cool, it attracts the audience if people are talking about the shot later why not yeah but i'm saying it has to make sense for me so whether it be static or movement it is the story that gets out the camera as i've always stressed it's never about just individually putting the camera and shooting something if you're not understanding what is happening so if the if i want the say the audience to just look at these two people talking and i don't want them to feel distracted for even a second i'd probably put a static shot but at the same time, if I want them to understand that there's so much of fluctuation happening, then I'll keep on moving the camera. I'll keep on, you know, creating that sense of uh, fluctuations in the audience also that, listen, listen, everything is shifting. You don't know what's happening. So I think that's when your creative calls these things come. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now? So, uh, yeah, as of now, honestly, I'll be very honest with you. There's nothing that I've... Uh, started yeah. but everything is on a talking talking basis yeah. so there's nothing to yeah. tell i think last i did was eagle with uh, ravi teja sir so after that it's just i'm just waiting to finalize something yeah uh, any uh, plans on going back to direction sometime soon yeah, yeah yeah i've got a web series ready and all that stuff which is happening but it's just that it uh, in its own time because mm. direction requires too much time. Right? Yeah. It requires good four or five years of your life going there. So if before I step into that again, I'll really, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sir, I will end with this yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, something we think of right now is that filmmaking has become accessible to almost everyone. Uh, but with things like high cost of equipment and the amount of money that is involved in post-production. Is filmmaking really accessible to everyone? It's more accessible than it ever was, you know. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, I keep saying this, it's so much more accessible than it ever was. You know, there was a time when we used to shoot in films and when uh, even for someone to shoot, you couldn't just look at a screen and shoot. You didn't have that a screen. There was a time when a director's only way of knowing if the shot is okay is through the cinematographer's eyes who'd say yes or no. You never had the luxury of seeing something and deciding what you want to do. If I had to take a shot of the heroine, the only person who could, you know, I could, as a director, I could ask is the cinematographer, is the shot okay? And he'll say okay or not okay. Yeah. In today's time, everything is so accessible. Your iPhone footage, I was surprised when I see people sometimes shoot with iPhone and I look at it and I'm like, I can't do this shit. 
I'll be very honest. I feel like I can't do. I'm not that advanced technologically. But I feel that in today's time, there's nothing stopping you. The budget is not a concern if you ask me at all. When I made 10, it was made in a very small budget. And it's a choice we had made because I knew the story didn't want, need such a huge budget. But if today if someone has a story to tell, there should be nothing stopping you. There's no way that things have become, things have become so cheap. Hmm. Post-production also, what is the thing? You need a laptop and you need FCP on it. You can sit and you can edit. So I, I still feel if someone really wants to make a film, there's nothing stopping. Budget is the last of my concerns now. Years back, 20 years back, you would have asked me, it was such a different industry where everything was so dependent on the film camera, where everything was so dependent on the labs. Today, if you think about it, more tomorrow you want to make a film. You get your script ready. You go, you scout the locations. You go to a rental house, say get the basic of camera. You go shoot. What do you do next? You take it to your home. You edit it. Okay, if you want music also, there are enough studios which are, don't require such a thing. You don't need a Dolby out for everything these days. You get it done and your film's out. Yeah. The next thing is, of course, the release. That's the biggest challenge if you ask me today. The making is not the challenge. The problem is, these days, if you ask me, getting the film out, which again, you have answers to. You have a film festival where you can start putting your film. You can go to OTTs later. You can start doing all that. So it's much. It's a much better time yeah, for films yeah. compared to what it was earlier. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's amazing, sir. Uh, that's also very reassuring. So, mm. thank you so much hey, for most that. Welcome, yeah. um, I'm glad we got to speak about so many things. Everything from Ulidavaru Kandante, which is almost everyone's favorite right now. <laughs> and you. I'm glad to be speaking to the DOP of that. Uh, we spoke about Ulidavaru Kandante, Avane Sriman Narayana, 10. And thank you for telling us so much about the technical aspects of cinematography because uh, largely to a general audience uh, that is somewhat inaccessible. Uh, to hear it from you, to hear it from someone who's shot a lot of our favorite films, that was a pleasure for thank me. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you so much for that, sir. And I'm looking forward to everything you do next. Thank you. All thank the best you. with that. Thank you so much, Mohan. Thank, thank you. you.